know, they hear that we're going to study Shakespeare and they have a number of different reactions. Some of them are um, excited to do this, some of them are scared to death, and some of them are bored to tears. And so my challenge as a teacher is to help them get to a place where Shakespeare becomes theirs. And so we start off the unit talking about some big questions. We call them debatable questions, such as um, what is stronger love or fear? Do you need to separate yourself from your family in order to define who you are? And the kids talk about it in terms of their own lives, but then um, we read this big piece of literature and we try to get them hooked into it and then apply those questions to the text itself. So with this part of the lesson we had wrapped up the, um, the reading of the play and now it's going back and revisiting those debatable questions and saying what have we learned from the play that we can then use to add to that conversation. And so, so it was a, a way of bringing them back full circle to what we started with but then also adding that new layer of understanding and it really gels it for them and they realize at that point that this belongs to them. <laughs> Yes, she does. Does Taylor Swift's song yeah. tell exactly the, so the no. story of her and Julia? She just said, um, well, wait, I forgot the word. Well, like, first time I don't know what her own It does end as a comedy, doesn't it, right? Because they don't kill themselves at the end of that song. Wait, so, like, in the song, like, he's like, stay away from Julia, which is technically, like, saying, like, don't be That's crazy. like, yeah, she and then she, like, don't run away from Julia or something like that. Yeah. Excellent. Anybody else? Yeah. Who's another? Shout it out. Okay, Deanna's got one. Let's listen to Deanna. That is excellent. How many of you have seen that show? That, was that show was my show. Oh, All right. Wait, what show? The Grim Adventures. Grim Adventures. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 You yeah. like picking yeah. 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 a nose? Yeah, definitely. All right. Oh, yeah. Master yeah. Andy has something. Let's yeah. hear it. Shout it out, Andy. Um, I can connect Romeo and Juliet with Finding Nemo. Because in Nemo, the father his love and children, kind of like Romeo's father and his dad loses his son for a while. I love it! Whose was that? Andrew. Nice, Andrew! That one was Brilliant. Nice. You know that we've been talking about vocabulary, and we've been talking about tier one, tier two, and tier three words. Can anybody tell me the difference between tier one, tier two, tier three? I'll get to it. Okay, Tamara, what you got? Okay, so tier one are words that you are, you know, tier two are words that you it's usually hear in classrooms or words that you somewhat know but don't fully understand. And then tier three are the words you don't stuff at all. Okay, so when you're talking about the tiers, you're talking about tier one that you know really well, like those are the words you own, right? Well, like it and the and we, like, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And tier two words, so the words that you don't have to think about when you use them. Tier two words 
uh, words that you're going to run into in your reading or you might hear them on TV or wherever. Who can give me an example of a tier two word? Like apocalypse. Apocalypse. Like we don't always use that, but we know what it is like. Oh, okay, maybe I thought a tier two word was like a word that you don't use that often. Well, you, it, you may not use. Or you might not know. You, you might know use. it or you might not. But it's not a word that, that you just use automatically. So like proliferate. Proliferate would be a great tier two word. Okay. Yes. Okay. I don't even know if that means I saw them along. Okay. <laughs> so tier three are content specific words. So these are words that you're going to run into just in science or just in English or just in tech ed. Like an Erwin Meyer class. Yes, that would be a very good tier three word. I don't even know what that is. Oh, it's yes. a class? That's so what I've given to you is a little review of those words, and here's how it's going to work. In the first column, you're going to see um, word. So you can see that some of the words are missing and some of the words are provided for you. The second column says definition. You can see that some are there and some aren't. There's a third one that says Romeo and Juliet example. I've given you some examples and left some blank. I'm going to have you get together with a pick a stick partner, and you are going to um, work on this together for about 10 minutes and see how many of these boxes you can fill in. All right, work together, collaborate. And then um, I also want you to think about do you own this word yet or not? And if this isn't something you're going to be graded on, I just want you to assess it for yourself. Do I know this word? Do I own it or not? Okay? So, I see some of you have already started, but let's get you with some partners. Okay? So we're going to pick um, Alex and Ethan. Go find your partner and take about 10 minutes and see what you can do to fill this all in. All right? In your partnership now, you should have figured out who's the one and who's the two, all right? So we're going to do something called numbered heads together, right? I'm going to roll the dice. And granted, we only have two people in our group, so we're going to roll the dice and see is it going to be number one or number two, all right? And I'll roll it till I get a one or a two. And then, um, depending on which number comes up, then all of those people need to stand up. Who has an answer for the first one? The definition is, the story that focuses on solutions, luck and cunning lead to good fortune, suggests we become better people after surviving life's challenges and ends well. What is it? Comedy. Comedy. Good example is Romeo, Benvolio, and Mercutio happen to run into the Capulet servant who can't read. And they see that who's on the list. Rosaline, and what luck, Romeo wants to win her heart, but the boys want Romeo to do what? Find other pretty girls. Find other pretty girls. You got it. Okay, thank you, odd people. Have a seat. Let's roll the dice again. You're going to be standing a lot, right? Here we go. It is even. All my even folks stand up. The second one. Can I have a volunteer to read that second one? Who wants to do? All right, Jasmine, go for it. Good definition. Yes, give us, give us the word, the definition, and tell us your example. Tragedy, a story that focuses on problems. Tragic flaw in the main character leads to his or her downfall. Suggests life's challenges will destroy us and ends badly. And we said Romeo and Juliet kill themselves. Excellent. Very nice. Thank you very much. And if any of the rest of you have something you want to throw out because it's just too good not to share, please do. All right. Here we go. Next one. This would be even. All my even people stand up again. Let's have a different even person do foreshadowing. Who's got it? Mr. Andy in the back, what you got? Um, foreshadowing, I said for the definition, something in the text or play that will tell if something is coming up that's important. Excellent. What's the example? Um, Juliet looks down. There were a number of things about the lesson that are culturally responsive, so a number of strategies that we combine together. Um, for example, using the four corners where students have to match their opinion um, 
to you know, ask them a question, then they have to go to a corner that, um, that matches what they think about it. But then also working in this idea of putting your two cents in as well, where they all had two pennies, and then when they wanted to say something, they had to put the penny in the bucket. And what that does is it encourages every single kid to have a voice and to be included in the discussion. And it also, um, it, it helps those kids who tend to dominate conversations to hold back a little bit because the idea is, is that everyone needs to use their pennies first before another round can start. So, so it, it, um, it anchors the learning in their lives and it bridges between you know, what they're living and what they're learning and again, makes that connection happen for them. But then it also brings everybody in. Come get your two cents. That's okay. We ran. Divorce, we had it and died. Divorce, we had it and died. All right, so here's what you're going to do with this strategy. You have two cents. And I want to know what your two cents are. If somebody says, uh, you put your two cents in, it means give us your ideas. All right? So I'm going to put up a statement on the board. And you're going to decide which corner best represents your thoughts about that statement. Okay? Over by the door is disagree. Up here by the, uh, the Garfield lunchbox is going to be agree. Over here back behind Ethan is slightly agree. And up here by Justin is slightly disagree. All right? So there's no neutral ground. You have to choose one side or the other, but you can be varying degrees of that. All right? Can then, you stand in between? Can you stand between? I want you to pick one of the four corners. Okay? Ooh, then I'm going to ask you for, some, for your ideas about it, but I really want you to try to work in some evidence from Romeo and Juliet. Because we've talked about some of these questions already before we started reading the play, but I want to know what have you learned from the play that's made you think deeper about this question, okay? So when you have something to say, I just want you to walk out of the corner and put my nice orange bucket right here, and I want you to throw your penny in the bucket and give us your two cents. <laughs> Look at all my optimists. I love it, okay? <laughs> Who wants to put their two cents for it? Okay, just walk forward and put it in the bucket. Wait, one or two? Just one. Take the microphone and tell us what you think. Um, I think love is stronger than fear because in Romeo and Juliet, like, they were willing to be with each other no matter what, like, they didn't care about their lives at all. And the fact that Romeo was willing to kill himself because Juliet was dead, like, you can tell he really was in love with her. Okay. Just come on down. Put your two cents in. Or your one cent. I believe love is uh, stronger than fear because Juliet was willing to go into her, uh, the tomb to be with uh, Romeo out of love, even though she was like really scared too. Ooh. I see, very nice. It is necessary to separate yourself from your family to be yourself. <laughs> Um, I think it's necessary to separate yourself from your family because, like, your parents have like an image of you that you sometimes you don't always agree with that image. So, like, you have to separate yourself, like, go with your friends to be yourself, you know, so you can be who you want to be. Okay, and don't forget to relate it to Romeo and Juliet when you can. That's true. Okay, that's okay. That's good. Thanks. It was Justin. That's true. <laughs> I believe that you have to separate yourself from your family to be yourself because, like Arnitria said, your parents want you to be a certain way. Like, they have extreme expectations of you. They want, for instance, they want you to get all A's and sometimes you just can't meet that. And they want you to behave a certain way, to do certain things in the house, but sometimes it's just, that's just not who you are. And if you want to be who you are, you have to separate yourself from them and you have to just let yourself be who you are. And to connect it with Romeo and Juliet, when Juliet said, um, a name is just a name, it doesn't define who you are. It really connects to this topic because a name is 
and back then it was just a name was basically your family. So you had she was saying that no matter who you are and what family you're from, you're still who you are and you still have to be yourself. Beautiful. I'll suggest a round of applause for that. Very nice. Anybody else? Okay. Well, this class is really fantastic about discussing things. They, from the first day of school, they've been talkers with one another, and they listen to one another, and they build off of one another. Um, and so they they are a really close knit community. And so that worked well because it really took advantage of their strength as a class that they, um, they like to deal with these big topics. They like to, to get in and discuss things and find out what, it, what each other thinks. Um, I know there was one kid, one of my favorites, who went back to the bucket and pulled out a coin, a couple other coins, because she wanted to say a couple other things, but I let her. <laughs> I have to say that our district is becoming beautifully diverse. And I've been here for 15 years, and we've had a big population shift, and we brought in a lot of different families and a lot of different cultures and traditions. And the thing that I love about culturally responsive instruction is that it, it lets everybody know that they matter and that they count and what they've come from and, and, and what they've been taught at home and all of those amazing lessons they've gotten in their lives matters, and it fits together, and it weaves together into this beautiful fabric that is our school. Um, and so, and the other piece, too, is that um, it really brings students into the center of the learning. It's not about me speaking. It's not about, about me being the sage on the stage delivering instruction. It's about making it theirs, that they become partners in it, because then it sticks, and that's beautiful.